Our session focuses on science diplomacy to support human security and sustainable development. I will co-moderate this session together with Monfi Zubi, science advisor of the Interaction Council and fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science. And we have um, an amazing lineup of uh, speakers, which we are going to introduce as we dive into the session. And we hope that at the end of the um, interventions, we have uh, four speakers uh, of 12 minutes each. We hope that at the end of these four interventions, we will have a very uh, lively uh, Q&A session. So please um, send uh, your questions and comments as we go along the um, presentations, and we will make sure that all of your comments and questions uh, get um, are represented in the discussions. Science diplomacy to support human security and sustainable development. The World uh, Academy of Art and Science has a UN uh, supported project and a lot of work on the concept of human security. It's all, it all, we also try to mobilize the inter um, academy partnership a partnerships of all the academies in the world to endorse a statement about uh, human security and it's important for the transition to sustainable development. In this introductory remark, I just want to highlight that we consider human security to have eight different aspects economic security, health security, personal security, food security, environmental security, community security, political security, and technological security. And we by no means want to argue that this is an exclusive um, list. It can be expanded. But what we uh, try to do is to identify explicit ways to quantify these different eight aspects of human security and make sure that we have a clear picture of how secure each uh, region of the world or each country of the world or each subscale of the national um, uh, geographical uh, units are by how much secure. For me, it is important to be able to measure the level of security and also connect this quantification to the implementation of the sustainable development goals because the sustainable development goals and the UN uh, agenda 2030 is basically our global common agreement of how to escape the current multi-crisis in order to support human welfare. And human security is uh, one big part of human welfare. And I see the um, Sustainable Development Goals as a means to achieving the support of human security and human welfare. So we work on um, connecting human security with the transition to sustainable development with the premise that what both are safeguarding are overall human and social welfare. I would propose that uh, we go ahead um, and uh, invite Dr. Jin Feng Zhou, 
the Secretary General of the China Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Foundation to take the screen for 12 minutes, please, uh, so that we get Thank things you. moved. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'm from China Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development to share foundation and to share our understanding of science diplomacy to support human security and the sustainable development. Our foundation was started from science diplomacy. Our thanks to WAS for the opportunity. And to start with, our foundation was started with science diplomacy. Uh, during the Hong Kong returning ne negotiation between China and the United Kingdom, a British Duke, Duke of Bedford, decided to return some paradise deer back to China, which was extinct at that time. And uh, with the reintroduction of the paradise deer back to China, we set up the China Paradise Deer Foundation. It is a, a good starting point and a good example of science diplomacy, not only to support Hong Kong's returning negotiation, but also to support us to start this journey to do the sustainable development. We changed our name after China joined the Convention of Biological Diversity and change our name again because of the climate uh, change. So we now call China Biodiversity Conservation in the Green Development Foundation. And uh, I would like to show share a few stories. 10 years ago, together with Berjim scientist, and we put the uh, sensor uh, UK, a UK company sensor on Beijing Swift. The Beijing Swift and find out where are they going? They only stay in Beijing for three months, May, June, and July. After July, they go all the way down to Africa and South Africa. Every year, they spend the rest nine months, other places, and returning back to Beijing to have a baby. They only have baby in Beijing. But because of Beijing's construction, they lost many of their homes. The number of Beijing Swifts decreased, dropped, in danger. And because of their home at Beijing, lost their home in Beijing. Those Beijing Swifts, so-called Beijing Swifts, but they spend most of their time in Africa. They eat termites, they eat bugs, they eat mosquitoes. Without the, the Swifts, those ecosystems will, will have serious problems. So that is human security. Whenever Wherever there is a hole, we're on the same boat. Wherever there is a hole, the boat will sink. No matter where you stay, you are not secured. This, we found this 10 years ago, and we are going to do further start research on this to find out the climate change, will that affect the behavior. That is sense diplomacy. And another, the second story is about uh, a conservation area. China local authority are planning to apply for UNESCO's heritage. We visit uh, Ramasa, we talk to the uh, UNESCO, try to stop them because there is a special area which is not included in the heritage, but which should be included to protect 
those mandatory birds. After our efforts, I fly to uh, to join the, the Ramesses Cup to talk to the sector executive sector. And uh, through all our efforts, finally, the local authority added put uh, the special migratory birds habitats into the heritage. That is a great success of science diplomacy. This is another story. In uh, 2018, we had with support of local uh, people, we hold a China Africa Wildlife Conservation Cooperation Forum in Johannesburg, South Africa. Through that forum, we talk to local Chinese and uh, to stop to stop pangolins hunting, to stop illegal pang pangolin trading, which is a very serious issue for the species of pangolins in Africa. That is through that uh, forum, uh, together with scientists and the local authorities, we set up the cooperation. That is also part of sustainable development. The fourth story is about the, a spotted seal. Spotted seal are also listed in red list in the in Denver with UNEP, with GEF, with the surrounded governments, including South Korea, Japan. We set up a series of workshops to talk to villagers, to youngsters about how to protect, how important it is to protect the sea spotted seals, which is a uh, part of uh, to secure our uh, marine lives. The first story is about Madagascar. 20 years ago, the forest coverage of Madagascar is over 90, not zero. But now it's about less than 20% forest coverage. Why is that? Because of the rust world, because of the business. So we, in China, we are trying to fight to stop rust wood furniture business to stop those illegal business trading. And also together with uh, Revell, American NGO, we, we uh, support some fund to support the local Madagascar people to planting trees. That is also, I think, is a very significant uh, part of sustainable development. The next story is about the uh, conophytum, a special plant. Now it's very popular in China. You can easily purchase them through internet. But that make oh, about the 200 species of conophytum are listed or listed on CITES Annex 3. All of them are endangered because some illegal trafficking, some people, business people, higher local people did to dig those in the wild. They are only uh, uh, habitats in uh, south, uh, in Afri south of Africa. Because of that business, which were damaged the conophytum, existence of in the wild. We filed litigation against those major Chinese businessmen. We failed the litigation uh, because uh, we lack of evidence. We are trying to uh, contact the South Africa Police Department, but uh, we don't have the right help. But although we failed the case, we win the bottle. Through our campaign, 
clean internet for kernel freedom. Now the business decreased. More and more people participate in our action, our uh, awareness to start buying the uh, kernel freedom. This uh, recent story, we signed an agreement with the uh, Azerbaijan National Academy of Science that the person who the uh, agreement uh, is the president of the Azerbaijan National Academy of Science. We want to work together to support COP29 most science scientist uh, participation. And because of COP29 COP were hosted in Azerbaijan. And we also work closely with IUCN, uh, Convention of Biological Diversity, Ramsar, CITES, in other, including international standard organizations. Through that cooperation, set up regulation, uh, 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 propose uh, some regulation and uh, standard the works. We work with international scientific uh, uh, academic society to protect our human security and the sustainable, sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you so much for all these amazing initiatives that really um, makes the, um, the the frog leap uh, for using uh, science uh, into creating partnerships that can facilitate, incubate, facilitate, and help the implementation of um of the sustainability transition this is exactly what i had in mind uh, to say um need to do we scientists need to uh, go out there to look other stakeholders be it policymakers politicians businesses financial institutions the civil society and gain their trust with regards to the scientific solutions that we have, but at the same time invest in providing capacity, knowledge, skills for all other stakeholders to understand the solutions and feel confident to use them, to become part of the labor force of the um, ecosystem of different stakeholders that will actually implement the solutions. And that's why science diplomacy is uh, crucial. Um, we would be, we are very interested in what you showed in the COP. Did you already, um, uh, you showed with regards to what you expect to do in the COP. Uh, did you already achieve uh, some sort of collaboration with UNFCCC? Do you, do you have, um, uh, are you discussing directly with them? We have applied uh, uh, side events with them, and also we signed an agreement with Azerbaijan, with Baku, Azerbaijan government, uh, to participate since yeah. the COP29 were host in Baku. And uh, we are waiting for feedback from U uh, UNFCCC for the, but uh, previously we already have side event and we have uh, fully participated participate and also we visit Boom for the preparation of Paris workshops. Excellent. Uh, that's uh, great. We are also as uh, World Academy of Art and Science, but also as IFORIA, the Alliance of Excellence for Research and Innovation in sustainability that I lead uh, very active participants at the COP and we would really like to um, meet you there and see how we can help you there. I also lead the UN 
uh, sustainable development solutions global climate hub that is working on developing transition pathways to climate neutrality and climate resilience uh, for uh, all countries in the world at national level. So I would like uh, to take this conversation with you further because you are doing exciting uh, things that uh, we would like uh, to collaborate with you and your group. Thank you. And Thank also you. I would like to mention we have a very close uh, discussion with China Climate Envoy. And uh, so we understand uh, the China points and we also uh, suggest them what we are doing. And uh, thank you. We are looking forward to work under your guidance uh, to make uh, the COP29 uh, more fruitful from the science uh, points of view. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker is one of the um, uh, most important uh, um, people that support the uh, World Academy of Arts and Science, uh, Emil Constantinescu, um, who is, uh, first of all, I will refer to him as a professor, uh, uh, but also a politician, a uh, president of Romania between 1996 uh, 1996 and 2000 and uh, we are very honored uh, to have you here and uh, listen to what you think uh, that um, science diplomacy can do to support and accelerate the transition to sustainability and human security. The floor is yours. Um, dear colleagues uh, and esteemed audience, uh, more than 50 years uh, after the publication of my first uh, scholarly article and the beginning of uh, academic career spent under dictatorship and later under democracy, I have uh, taken the subject of our panel um, of the relationship between science and diplomacy uh, very personally. And uh, I would like to begin by sharing my experience with you. Uh, I first um, exercised classical diplomacy as head of state between 1996 and 2000 at a moment of rupture in history, the end of Cold War and the collapse of criminal communist dictatorships. Relations in the academic world were useful to me as uh, was my experience in the National International Association of University Rector, first and foremost in order to adequately uh, manage the great egos in the political uh, environment also. Uh, after my presidential term, I returned to civic and academic life. <clears throat> first, uh, practicing uh, a cultural diplomacy in the Balkan political club uh, designed for uh, reconciliation between the nations that had been uh, scared by secular conflicts in Balkans especially and in Eastern Europe. Uh, and uh, then um, as president of the Academy of Cultural Diplomacy in Berlin, uh, where I launched um, the Levant Initiative for Global Peace, uh, and uh, built a postgraduate system of master and doctoral programs in uh, cultural diplomacy uh, as part of a um, network of universities designed to promote uh, cultural peace uh, through education. When um, I had the honor of being elected as a fellow of uh, then uh, and then uh, trustee of the World Academy of Art of Science, I understood uh, that it was possible to take my effort uh, to the next level. The election of Gary Jacobs, of president and CEO of the Academy, has deeply transformed the former uh, ivory tower, academic milieu, opening new channels of communication between the Academy and uh, the global economic, political, and social uh, environment. Our problem today 
is how best to use channels for what we can call uh, science diplomacy to support uh, human security and uh, sustainable development. <clears throat> First, uh, let's set the uh, record straight. Science has only one objective, the search for truth. The result of scientific research can be and have been used for the advancement or destruction of mankind. It is uh, the scholars themselves who are responsible for the ethics of science. The success of uh, scientific diplomacy depends on their prestige. The World Academy of Art of Science was formed in the 1960 after the end of the Second World War. Einstein, Oppenheimer, Fleming, John Bernal, and its other founding scholars were known and respected throughout the world. They used the prestige they uh, had gained in academia to use people to use the achievement of science for peace, not war. <laughs> Only 15 years has passed since uh, the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima of Nagasaki. We can say that their initiative had the positive consequences because uh, uh, to this day, nuclear energy has not been used to destroy human life. Even if this uh, had been achieved uh, through a balance of fear. But the deterrence uh, through mutual fear has in fact been uh, the fundamental method of classical diplomacy for its inception to present day. Just as the prestige of scientists mattered after the end of the Second World War, so it mattered once again in world history at the turn of the century in the 1990s, after the end of Cold War, when the peoples of the world that had self-liberated from the criminal communist dictatorship of the Soviet Empire <laughs> after its collapse, elected by free popular votes in all the liberated countries of Central and Eastern Europe, <clears throat> leaders from academia. For those who do not know, I can list a few such countries, <clears throat> Poland, Czechia, Hungary, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Armenia, and Romania. <clears throat> we academics from the former communist states experienced the transition from an authoritarian state to the hope of a society based on humanist ideas. And uh, we are now experiencing the disillusion of an increasingly interest-based and profit-driven society, which has the meanwhile invaded, invaded the academic milieu. <clears throat> My question is, is there any real prestige for scholars in society today? Is their voice still important? In a universally connected social networking world, who has, who has the power to influence how things get done? What takes precedence? The opinion of scientists who publish on specialized niche platforms, or the opinion of influencers of social on social platforms with billions of followers. In spite uh, of how different social structures uh, and the organization of society have been for two millennia, even in uh, autocratic regimes from Aristotle and Seneca to the French Academy under Louis XIII and the XIV, the voices uh, of great thinkers were always, always listened 
with respect in elite circles, of course. Can we still speak of such respect being shown today? In our um, contemporary de democratic society, we no longer have to deal with um, authoritarianism based on the repressive power of state organs. However, the influence of the profit-driven industrial banking system has grown to such an extent that the leader of large transnational corporate corporations no longer require the wisdom or the solution offered by scholars. They, don't, they know better what needs to, to be done and successfully promote themselves through their own books, conferences, and the social media they, uh, that they own. <clears throat> In preparing uh, this panel, we are asked uh, to come up uh, with a solution instead of problems. In order to be able to propose viable solutions, we need to start uh, from the problems of the academic environment, not from uh, the promise, uh, promise of successes uh, that have in fact uh, proved illusory. The failure of academia to influence society at the beginning of the 21st century raises the questions uh, I have to ask myself as uh, someone who has spent more than half a century in academia. Where have the scholars of the 21st century gone wrong? I would, I would list just a few directions. But the acceptance of excessive pragmatism. Can fundamental research or higher education bring you short-term profit? The excessive idealism in the construction of political strategies based on uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's principles that man is dedicated exclusively to the good. The promotion of social utopias, such as uh, uh, eradicating poor poverty or uh, eradicating unemployment, when in reality, as best we can speak of reducing them. Um, the self-subordinating attitude of scholars working in the public arena toward the communication specialists of the United Nations, you, you bureaucracies uh, who have created a popular language uh, of words to which uh, they have given symbolic meaning to cover the lack of deep and uh, nuanced thinking. Um, the invasion of academia by populism and political partners, neither have any place in science communications, or if you want to call in science diplomacy. And uh, finally, the academic uh, reaction to no history, no culture slogans coming out uh, from uh, university. I believe uh, that the priority goal will be to avoid the rupture of our contemporary society from uh, the humanist culture that underpins it uh, which is under threat by the very technological process we cheer. In order to have success in society, we must first focus our efforts on uh, the academic milieu in its relationship with a younger generation from which the decision makers of tomorrow will be drawn. Do we wish uh, to offer use information or impart them knowledge? Do we wish to instill a spirit of confrontation or dialogue? 
are we preparing professional careers or building strong characters? And uh, will we be capable of deploying our experience to these ends? In uh, the current condition, it is difficult to speak uh, of a bright future. Over the past years, um, I have had the opportunity to address uh, large numbers of youth, uh, both in person and online. Um, 50,000 joining from uh, Islamabad in Pakistan, uh, 60,000 students in the Lucknow in India, and 30,000 youth in Seoul, uh, South Korea. They were all uh, eager to contribute to the sustainable peace and development of the world in which uh, they will live in, in the future. Perhaps uh, we are, uh, there are many problems and much suffering. There we may also find uh, greater hope and individual uh, involvement. If um, our experience uh, is to be useful, then perhaps uh, like and ancient Greeks uh, used to say, uh, will we have uh, the merit of those um, who saw trees uh, in those shade uh, they know uh, they will never see it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... So, um, I just wanted to ask very quickly, but I'm sure your intervention has aroused lots of interest. Uh, you mentioned that science failed. Um, uh, uh, however, I think uh, that one could also argue that science produced an array of solutions increased uh, the um, welfare of people or at least supported the welfare of people um, in, in such a way that although we are on unsustainable pathways with regards to planetary boundaries and with regards to our uh, economic models potential, of uh, continuing growth, uh, I would say that all this technology led to an increase in the uh, standard of living, in the educational standard, in the access to um, uh, goods and services and information that is unprecedented in human history. And one would argue never before, at least in the developed world, so many people had access uh, to good, um, uh, had access to the means of living a life that would, uh, that they do today. Never before did we live such a life. It is unsustainable, yes, but in uh, the bigger part of the Western world, this is a life that allows you access to education. It um, allows you access to the basic, uh, to the goods and services that support your basic needs. And uh, at the same time, allows you uh, to uh, choose uh, within boundaries, but have a freedom of choice with regards to your um, to your um, uh, future. So, in in my perception, and this is very personal, uh, uh, humans uh, have, uh, at least in the developed world, have achieved a huge acceleration uh, with regards to uh, their ability uh, to sustain um, a welfare and standard of living that is far beyond what we could imagine a hundred years ago. 
And all of this, and most of this has to do with uh, the, the science, what science produce uh, that uh, as solutions to basic problems uh, that provided technology and access to uh, natural resources and access to educational resources that are crucial. Don't, don't, don't you think that all this powerful uh, ability can be transposed into one that is also sustainable rather than just saying that science uh, failed? Um, first of all, I agree totally what you said, because uh, it represents uh, historical, uh, historical reality. Uh, but uh, this is um, uh, characteristic, it's applicable to the Western uh, democracy and uh, market economy in the uh, uh, last, uh, last centuries. Um, why we, uh, we need uh, to know the history? Because now uh, uh, perception of this relation between uh, science, technology, and the progress of society is not so clear. Firstly, was science in the Renaissance uh, uh, Renaissance period, science uh, prepared uh, the fundament fundament for technology. Uh, in the moment of uh, fall of uh, Constantinople, a part of uh, intellectuals and scientists migrate to Italy and Western uh, Europe. And the moment the um, Catholic Church admit um, the Greek, uh, the Greek um, testimony of culture and science, and uh, was the first university was a place where science uh, becoming an exceptional development. And after was the relation between uh, technology and ability of technology to use uh, um, the resources, natural resources. This is a period, but Remembering, we must be remembering this relation, science, technology, uh, progress. Uh, now, is a, in, in my opinion, personal opinion, is a moment of decadence of Western civilization. Why? Because it's a rupture between culture and civilization. Civilization without culture is a moment of... Uh, of the solution. When I um, uh, formed the Institute of uh, Advanced Study of Levan Culture and Civilization, idea was um, to uh, come back to the roots of Western civilization. Uh, Greek uh, democracy, um, Jewish, uh, Christian uh, religion, Normal and uh, uh, Justin and Code. Justin and Code was in uh, Constantinople, not in uh, Roma. And also, we need to keep in our memory mythology, what represented culture in others of the soul. Now is a, just a moment when, in, in my opinion, we, we must focus on. Uh, um, in artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a moment of, car of um, carful in, in the French, uh, the moment, of, moment to decide what, uh, how it's important uh, to keep humanistic ideas, conscious, human conscious. Uh, sure, uh, this is a problem of um, Western world. But now it's not possible to talk only about the Western world and uh, the rest of the world. 
uh, is a simple. Uh, I accept all you 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 said. Uh, the argument is don't exist migration to Russia, for example. Don't exist migration. Migration is to Western system, democracy and uh, market economy. But now is a moment to, to think what is the future of market economy? What is the future of uh, Western civilization? Indeed. Indeed, we are at this very crucial uh, point in time. I fully endorse what you said about consciousness and, and the need for science to be culture informed and connected. And this was an amazing answer. And I hope many, many people can watch it on video. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I, to, uh, due to the uh, time limitation, I need to give the floor to my uh, co-moderator, uh, uh, Dr. Monif Zubi, uh, to continue with the rest of the uh, speech. Uh, I'm very grateful for all that has been heard until now, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much, Phoebe. Thank you very much, uh, President Konstantinescu and uh, Professor Zhu for some outstanding ideas that you've talked about over the last couple of presentations. Uh, we still have two more eminent speakers to go. Uh, without further ado, I would request uh, Marcela Munoz, who's, uh, who works for a fantastic organization in Geneva, uh, she is Executive in Residence Fellow at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. Uh, she is also the Strategic Partnerships Director at the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator, which is a fantastic organization with a fantastic name. Um, and she's a member of the Advisory Council of the Democracy Lab. Uh, Marcella, you have the screen for 12 to 15 minutes, please. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Munif, and thank you, uh, Was, for inviting me to this uh, very interesting conversation. It's, it's so nice to hear so, so many different but complementary ideas. Uh, with the view to place us in a better place, I would say, in terms of uh, upholding human security, uh, sustainable development, and also thinking about the future. And perhaps uh, my intervention is a little bit of that, because uh, as it has been said this afternoon, uh, we are living in a golden age of science and, and technology, and there is exponential acceleration of these developments, um, with longer term implications that those uh, we might uh, think about uh, sometimes because we're uh, pressed uh, to tackle the current challenges and sometimes tempted uh, also only to have perhaps a shorter view of, of what's coming our way or what is already in our face. And I think that um, this is important to highlight because these developments are affecting human society and the planet, which is exactly what uh, Dr. Sue was also mentioning. And, and they are not happening in isolation. And there are, as we know, big private investments. Uh, trillions and billions are being uh, channeled towards the development of science and technology. There is some public investment, but not as, as huge, as important in size and, and, and in alignment, perhaps. Um, compared to, to private technological development. And, and that raises questions. That raises questions uh, in terms of uh, perhaps increased inequalities, increased device, which is exactly what we want to prevent and hopefully uh, de-escalate and bring the benefits of science to all. So I, I think that it is important uh, perhaps to recognize that science is not benevolent. It's not a benevolent force, but it's a multiplier of power. 
And, and in this context uh, in which we live today, which is very complex, uh, geopolitically speaking, but also as uh, humanity faces ex existential uh, threats, but also amazing, amazing opportunities that we have never had before, particularly if we were to tap into the potential of, of scientific and technological breakthroughs, I think that we need to remind ourselves what unites us. And, and in that case, the Sustainable Development Goals is our common compass, I would say. It tackles on uh, the main issues that affect uh, the well-being and the prosperity of humanity. And it aims to bring inclusivity and, and peace and, and, and prosperity to all. So I, I think that having this uh, lighthouse, this northern uh, light perhaps, uh, Mm, bringing some sort of direction, not only to our conversation here, but to the things that we do is very important. And that's where science and diplomacy comes in, because I think that uh, we need more spaces. We need to bring oxygen, perhaps, to spaces which are already saturated or are perhaps uh, living a kind of a, a tense uh, and uh, ambiance. And we need to, to develop new mechanisms, complementary mechanisms, uh, for us to think hard about the medium and long-term implications of scientific and technological developments and how all the communities, the scientists, the academics, the politicians, the diplomats, the citizens, the private sector representatives can uh, brainstorm about perhaps the, the potential of, of science and technology and how they can work together to align their vision. Because if, if we have public infrastructure and investments or R&D in one direction and then private interest in another direction, and then the technology is going in another direction, I don't think that that will place us in a better stadium as a whole, as a society, as a, as a global society, but even at, at any level, national or regional. And, and we were uh, prompted to, to think about, reflect on, well, if this is the case, what can we do about it, right? How can we walk the talk, uh, so to speak? So, uh, what my organization does, AGESTA, the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator Foundation, is to look at uh, scientific breakthroughs in 5, 10, and 25 years. So it, it really brings in this longer view uh, with over 2,000 scientists from all over the world looking at these uh, emerging technologies, quantum computing, advanced AI, uh, neurotechnology, all these things that we, we start to see sometimes in, in Nature magazine or in an article uh, newspaper, you know, when uh, certain big tech investors are, are you know, uh, monopolizing perhaps uh, some of the conversation around uh, technologies. And, and we need to make sure that we go back to the science, to the science which is transparent, which is evidence-based, which is or should be open to all. And, and that's why it, it, we decided that we wanted to bring in this knowledge uh, to democratize the knowledge, uh, creating a platform in which we provide this knowledge every year in an updated way. And after that, to do something about it. Uh, so we also have the Dutan Park so that we can create some initiatives around this. I'm going to try to share my screen just to give you a flavor of what the radar is, the Science Breakthrough Radar, so I, I, I don't talk uh, in, 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 in abstract here. Uh, let me go to, to yes, perfect, to, to slide mode. So the radar, the Science Breakthrough Radar that we uh, develop every year with all these uh, colleagues and scientists around the world, look at a um, um, universe of uh, topics that are interesting uh, to society. And based on this, uh, we have uh, perhaps focused our attention on certain platforms, looking, as I was saying, in what are the developments that are coming our way. So for instance, if we look at tomorrow's computing, we know that the future of computing is evolving. Uh, there are these uh, simulation of, uh, you know, models of neurons that are boosting the, the uh, development, not only of hardware, but also software. And, and the experience that human beings may have in a couple of decades 
it's going to be uh, completely ambient in terms of uh, how artificial intelligence is going to be in, embedded in our lives. And even as, as regular citizens, uh, sometimes we cannot grasp the, the implications of what this means. And, and we also know that the future of Internet is, is quantum and, and that it's going to really, uh, you know, extrapolate and take to the next level the power that uh, many uh, different areas and fields like encryption and sensing and communications are going to bring. And we want to prevent that this is not monopolized, uh, but share. And, and if we go into the mind, for instance, neurotechnologies, uh, we're talking about next generation of implants and all these uh, brain uh, computer interfaces uh, with implants or devices that are invasive invasive or not. There are uh, the two types. And we see a very promising future in, in the field of healthcare and, and medicine, you know, uh, for instance, perhaps uh, restoring mobility to people who have lost uh, this capacity. But we can also think about the uses in, in the military domain and we can uh, perhaps imagine enhanced soldiers uh, not too far from, from, from today. So this is not science fiction. These are things that are being developed. And I think that not only governments uh, or private sector companies need to pay attention to, to these developments, but we need to develop a futures literacy ourselves, you know, as, as regular uh, human beings. And, and finally, perhaps my, my last example will be on anticipating complex uh, systems, uh, talking again about how perhaps artificial intelligence, but other emerging technologies can help us in having more participatory systems and you know stronger democracies and governance mechanisms in which we all can, can have a voice. So this is the radar. This is the think uh, part of what we do. Uh, and after uh, we develop um, a methodology in which we curate dialogues with all stakeholders, and we brainstorm about ideas. And based on that brainstorming of ideas, uh, we try to accelerate uh, solutions. And uh, we're a very young organization. We only started in 2019, uh, but I can already proudly share with you one of the initiatives that we have uh, incubated, which is the Open Quantum Institute. Um, this institute aims uh, to provide a platform in which big tech companies provide access to technology, uh, to quantum computing in these cases, and then we can try it out with simulations, uh, perhaps applications for the future of food systems or for water management, for climate change, for decarbonization, things that can really boost our achievement of the SDGs. Uh, so when I hear the Secretary General of the United Nations talking about uh, turbocharging the SDGs, I think that uh, we need to think hard of how far we are in that direction. And if would it be uh, smart perhaps to come up with science diplomacy mechanisms like you know coalitions like the one that I'm presenting to you now with this slide in which you have governments, you have big tech companies, you have academic institutions, international organizations developing already today uh, simulations for uh, the use of quantum computing for good and also trying to anticipate uh, governance uh, mechanisms that uh, can uh, get us uh, there. So um, I, I don't want to take a, a lot of time because I know that there will be opportunity uh, to have um, Q and A's, uh, which I uh, am pretty much looking forward to. Uh, but I just wanted uh, to share some of the of the approaches that uh, just uh, you know based out of Geneva, but also with this global aim. Uh, is is undertaking, uh, trying to make sure that we can use science and diplomacy uh, for good and uh, to activate already today initiatives uh, with the promise of, of science. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Marcella, for an outstanding expose. You talked about uh, science being um, the multiplier of power. You talked about us, the science community, the decision-making community, identifying or aligning our efforts to identify our Polaris, our uh, North Star. And I think 
as we have uh, uh, the vice president of WAS here and an eminent trustee of WAS, I would think that WAS is eager to have a slot within your network of organizations that are actively collaborating to come up with new ideas. Um, uh, with that, we move along to our uh, eminent vice president, uh, Donato Kiniger Pasili, uh, who's a thinker and a scholar. He's the last speaker in the session, and after his presentation, we will have Q&A time permitting. Um, Donato has just written a beautiful article in the uh, the voice of the um, uh, Italians, a New York Journal. Voice of New York. Voice of New York. Oh, I'm sorry, the Voice of New York. Uh, um, uh, and you're welcome to have a look at that after this session. We can share the link, I think. Um, Donato is uh, not only Vice President of the World Academy of Arts and Science, he's adjunct professor at the Universitat Oberta de Catalonia and senior advisor of UNITAR. Very experienced speaker and always a pleasure to listen to. So Donato, you have the screen for 15 minutes, please. Monique, very kind of you. I must say that uh... I enjoy the conversation. I'm enjoying this conversation uh, for its high value for the contributions of all speakers uh, to an approach that I feel uh, will is really making history, uh, is history in the making in various sense. I mean, first of all, because we are talking of uh, science, the power of science, uh, its creativity, uh, the innovation uh, that it contains, um, the knowledge that it represents, and because we're talking of diplomacy. Uh, diplomacy, uh, in reality, means cooperation, means international cooperation. We heard from Emil, uh, whose remarks I really appreciated a lot, uh, because uh, he... Uh, reconsidered the value of humanism uh, throughout history, uh, throughout our common history, and, uh, and said uh, that, of course, there are many threats, and we have to reposition ourselves in our discourse for a better humanity through our own um, in the tradition, throughout, through our, our own record, I would like to say. Uh, and that is so important because in any kind of uh, negotiation, when we are, since we are talking of diplomacy, uh, in any kind of dialogue, we should never forget who we are. We should always start from uh, the premise of uh, what do we represent uh, in, at this very moment, and what we represent in history. So I really appreciated Emil's comments that we're not negative at all. I mean, I, in fact, he agreed with Febi when uh, uh, we said, what is the value, what is the trend? The trend is not, uh, uh, well, it may appear negative in many ways when we talk about peace advancement or uh, a better quality of life for all, uh, in spite of all the agreements that we are reaching, it looks like we are not progressing that fast, especially uh, in, in the field of the Sustainable Development Goals and its implementation, we are very much lacking behind. But on the other hand, it's also true that we should look at these questions with pragmatism, but also with a certain degree of idealism. And this is how we can really match and make the best out of uh, science, uh, for diplomacy and science in diplomacy. What uh, Emil uh, reminded us also is the concept of uh, uh, science diplomacy uh, during Renaissance. And since, since after all, I'm a Florentine, I'm from Florence, Italy, I think it's good to remember the fact that in those epochal days, uh, the, there was no difference between art and science. Uh, the, the concept of art and science, I mean, somehow took uh, a deviation or, uh, uh, but later on, because of 
hyper-specialization, uh, forgetting the fact that we are talking of uh, creativity, we are talking of uh, uh, tradition, traditional knowledge, and sense of beauty. I mean, and the whole thing goes together. And, and when we relate uh, to uh, different cultures, when we relate uh, to people in different environments, uh, we should always try to represent, I repeat, represent uh, the, uh, the best of uh, our knowledge. Uh, so this is a science in that sense. It's really what science can bring uh, and, and what it does in reality for the present and future uh, generations. So sharing knowledge uh, and expertise is certainly part of uh, science diplomacy nowadays, uh, collaboration and research, um, and, uh, and, and, and sharing information across borders. This means really ultimately the uh, importance of, uh, um, uh, of, of exporting, as I said, the concept of, of peace. In the article that you kindly mentioned, uh, Monif, that is just in anticipation of a, a larger essay that will be published in Cadmus very soon uh, with uh, Cadmus is our uh, feature magazine of, of the World Academy with uh, the foreword of Gary Jacobs. Uh, there we will talk about more examples in, ter in terms of what I call a peace offensive. Peace offensive uh, is uh, uh, in a provocative uh, maybe um, term uh, that has been used in the 60s. Uh, and when actually we, uh, those who were actors at the time made strides and, and obtained uh, some uh, great uh, levels of success in terms of mediating uh, results through uh, science, through knowledge. And that's how we had uh, fantastic openings in, in dialogue, uh, you know, between, uh, um, between the USSR and, and, uh, and the United States, uh, Gorbachev and uh, Reagan. Uh, this is how we obtain also openings in the Middle East. Uh, many are the examples that are captured in this piece that will be published and I hope you will be uh, bring some uh, uh, um, some food for thoughts in this discussion. Uh, what is also relevant uh, in the use of uh, science and technology for diplomacy and diplomacy is uh, its effect uh, for uh, the gradual reciprocation in the reduction uh, of uh, the uh, aggressiveness, I would like to say, uh, uh, and uh, um, the, the level of uh, concessions that can be made on one side versus another uh, that help the dialogue, that help constructively instilling uh, confidence. That's why we talk about peace, uh, peace offensive, these reciprocal concessions that can be made in, in uh, situations of conflict uh, and we are unfortunately witnesses so many un intractable uh, considerations of conflict, but science diplomacy can have a beneficial effect. Of course, there are fields uh, where we see, uh, when we talk about uh, climate change, when we talk about biodiversity, um, when we talk in general of technological innovation, where this is already bringing fruits, but more can be done more, even more than what uh, came out of the Paris agreements uh, uh, in 2015 for climate change. More can come out if we uh, use uh, more and more uh, the uh, approach of uh, science in diplomacy. So uh, science in diplomacy consists of the fact that not, not necessarily you um, uh, create bureaus of uh, scientists that support traditional diplomacy. But it means, also means uh, uh, making sure that uh, knowledge is available to those that are uh, negotiating, that are uh, discussing solutions in, in various fora, bilaterally or multilaterally. This is, is very important because we are not just talking uh, of promotion, it's not 
is not marketing. And, and, and as in many cases, it has been in the past. I mean, it's not just promoting my best technology, my best uh, uh, knowledge uh, in order to affirm um, certain, uh, certain uh, uh, marketing uh, shares or, or gains. Uh, that's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is really enriching the dialogue, uh, stimulating that, and finding mutual solutions, finding uh, solutions that, Monif, you are very much aware of those with the sesame examples that you have been uh, uh, one of the promoters of, uh, where in, in many cases uh, we can see that uh, countries or, 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 or even uh, local entities that might be rivalries in certain fields, they come and they start uh, uh, cooperating and and they normally start cooperating uh, from uh, um, the, the the grassroots level from the local level and then you build up this sustainability uh, you build up this you scale up actually those interventions in order to make them uh, profitable for all uh, so once uh, solutions are profitable for all Obviously, uh, you also surmount global challenges uh, and uh, you improve uh, diplomatic relations. Uh, I want to mention, um, I hope we still have time, uh, one of the activities that uh, uh, the World Academy is uh, very much into it these days, uh, we are very much involved, uh, is uh, the promotion of uh, uh, science diplomacy with the International Parliamentary Union. It is not represented in this discussion, but we had a, a specific, uh, specific uh, slot during this conference uh, dedicated to it, and you can find a record about it. That is extremely promising because, as you well know, uh, parliamentarians represent uh, people, uh, represent the legitimate interest of people uh, in all all countries, and they must have access to the best possible knowledge in order to improve also their lawmaking uh, capacities, to improving uh, the, the, the laws themselves that they prepare, uh, that they, they pass, uh, and, and review them and make sure that, again, their, um, their political sense is accompanied at, by at all sides and in, 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 in all time uh, by a scientific knowledge. So that is also a function of, uh, uh, I would say, not necessarily of scientific uh, science diplomacy, but of scientific knowledge that uh, has to be coupled with uh, policy and therefore ultimately when di with diplomacy when we enter a multilateral field. So this, uh, I believe, that will be also a key in the resolution of many, of many conflicts worldwide. And I feel uh, personally, I know, uh, Monif, I would like to hear your opinion about that. I know we have time now, but I know uh, that you, as I do, uh, we feel uh, that much can be done uh, from a, a scientific, uh, in art perspective as well, in order to uh, resolve conflict or trying to resolve conflicts and trying to, to have a rapprochement uh, among, among uh, enemies that ultimately, among people in particular, they may have uh, the same sentiments. Uh, and so that has to be uh, worked on across borders uh, with uh, knowledge uh, transfer for sure, um, overcoming challenges, uh, and and and, serve, and certainly um, you know working towards re resilience. So this is work towards resilience through the uh, the um, diplomatic uh, diplomatic efforts and science diplomacy, as uh, Mar Marcella has shown to us. Uh, that I think is possibly an ingredient for successful diplomatic initiatives in the future, as it is right now. Um, there are many examples that illustrate that. I don't know if we have time uh, to mention them, uh, but I think that, uh, uh, again, in the Middle East, uh, but also uh, in Africa, in, in, in South America, Asia, etc., we have very ma many, many examples of successful initiatives that needs to be boosted, that needs to be reinforced, and brought to the uh, knowledge of the people. Because as someone said before, lots of this information is not shared. 
So we need to find a way, a system uh, to make information available to all. Thank you, Monif. Thank you very much, Donato. That was a fantastic expose of uh, uh, the ideas or the nexus between science and diplomacy and science for diplomacy. Um, and incidentally, I've shared the link to your article, which appears in the Voice of New York. You can have a look at that if you like. Um, thank you also, Marcella, for your excellent expose. Um, uh, I think we have about four minutes, uh, of which I will utilize a couple of minutes just to not summarize what we've uh, uh, talked about uh, this afternoon. Uh, however, maybe to try and capture some um, guidelines that we can promote at TWAS, the World Academy of Arts and Science, and at uh, uh, collaborative uh, meetings with uh, uh, organizations such as GESDA uh, and other organizations. Um, I think one of the ideas that has certainly been reiterated but what I've heard this afternoon is something that I've been thinking about for a while and that is um, maybe we are seeing human leadership not keeping up with the pace of scientific and technological advancement. That is the capacity of our decision makers all over the world to keep up with the pace of science, technology, and the advancement uh, uh, um, uh, happening in the scientific domain is not really fully appreciated by um, politicians and decision makers and the capacity of science to deliver also is not really fully appreciated by decision makers. Of course, we are fortunate in this group that we have an academic who tried to be, who was a, a senior politician in his country, Professor Constantinescu. Um, but that's a unique experience that I think other leaders can learn from. Uh, secondly, I would say that even education is not really keeping up pace with scientific and technological advancement. By the time that a teacher delivers an idea in a math class or a physics class or a biology class, some clever kid with an iPhone can find the answer to the, to the, the problem at hand in, in, in less than a femtosecond. Um, so that is an issue that is affecting education and affecting the worldview of our students um, in understanding what's happening in the world. Thirdly, and my final point, I think this session has reiterated again something that I've believed in for a very long time. And that is science is a transboundary trans-civilizational phenomenon. Science cannot be exclusively belonging to a certain culture or a certain civilization. Um, it's like science transcends cultures and civilizations. Uh, some scientific development might take place in China. The fallout from that, the result from that will be felt all over the world in, in a very short time. So that is something that we need to be aware of when, whenever we are trying to frame science diplomacy for, for decision makers. And because the problems we face as a human race are transnational, climate change is transnational, you do not have a country suffering from climate change or water shortages or energy problems, insecurity. It's, it's a phenomenon that crosses borders. Borders have no meaning uh, in the face of phenomena such as climate change uh, um, and loss of biodiversity, for example. And this is why I think we as a human race, we're lucky that we have science and technology at our disposal as a human race to address 
global problems. Um, that is an issue that I think we need to focus on whenever we're conveying uh, ideas to um, um, to decision makers and politicians. Um, now, if there are any questions, I think we have about, we've been given some eight more minutes, which is great. Um, so, um, I don't think there are any, any questions, but uh, if I may, uh, I'll invite Emil uh, to um, provide one or two words of wisdom at the stage after at the conclusion of this session. And then I'll invite the other speakers and my co-rapporteur, Phoebe, to wrap up. So, Emil, the screen is yours for two or three minutes, if you kindly uh, share with us some ideas. It is uh, difficult for me in, uh, in the, such a company of uh, high intellectuals and scholars. Um, for me, now uh, it's important uh, to think on this special relation between uh, cultural diplomacy. Cultural diplomacy was my field uh, in the last uh, uh, 24 years. And uh, science diplomacy. Um, is different, together is different from classical diplomacy. Classical diplomacy based on, on power, political power, military power, economic power. Uh, cultural diplomacy and science diplomacy is different. It's, so it's, uh, it's a soft, soft diplomacy, but it's different between difference between us. Why? Uh, cultural diplomacy is a fun, fund, fundament of cultural diplomacy, understanding the other. Because we need to keep this extraordinary diversity of cultures to respect uh, identities, cultural identities. It's important for all people, not only politicians, to understand the difference between uh, political borders in, for example, European Union and cultural borders. What represents uh, uh, European culture? Uh, without uh, Russia, without uh, uh, literature, Russian literature, uh, art, uh, uh, music. It's not related to political regimes in the long, uh, in the long uh, space and time. Um, if uh, cultural uh, diplomacy representing possibility to understanding other culture, other identities in a real dialogue, in a, for Febe, uh, in a Greek uh, philosophical dialogue is not between two persons. Dialogue is representing at the end of debate, the level is, is more high for, for both. Uh, if um, cultural diplomacy is under possibility of understanding the other, uh, scientific, uh, so uh, Donato uh, said, scientific, science diplomacy have not borders. For me, I am geologist, geolog uh, in science. And in geology, don't exist in border, political border. Mountains is the same rules in, from uh, in Alps, from uh, Pyrenees to Himalaya is the same on this fight of the political borders. Uh, science uh, uh, diplomacy is an instrument because at the beginning was the same, the same language, language of science. And also is a problem of confidence. 
And uh, what I said is important to the sense of science, uh, science diplomacy focused on scientists, of scholars. is a duty for the scholars to cooperate in this uh, large, uh, large uh, community of scientists. But now it's important to insist, to insist, to insist on the moral problems of uh, capacity, uh, all history of humankind, or the history of using the scientists discovered for uh, progress or for or put destroyed uh, humanity. And now it is a, is a last moment. I hope uh, inside of uh, uh, World Academy of Hydrosets to continue to talk about was uh, our lady colleague, I salute you, the problem to insist on artificial intelligence. Because uh, what you said before is a difficult moment when technology is uh, advanced and uh, conscience, the problem of conscience is now is, is important. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency, for a wonderful wrap-up. Uh, we have two minutes. Um, Donato, uh, yeah. uh, Professor Jo, are you there? Yes, I'm are here. You, are you? Okay. Well, we can give you 50 seconds. <laughs> you Thank can. you. Uh, yes, because of uh, the Professor sense... Zou, go of ahead and then Donato... Of... Go ahead, please. Because of the science and technology of industrial civilization, we the planet uh, now has over 8 billion population. And also, that science and technology make our planet broken our final habitats. We need a new civil human civilization, and we need uh, science and, uh, and technology breakthrough to help us to secure our habitats and the sustainable future. And that the sense, the new sense in technology will not let us down, but that we need to tackle our issues. Thank you. Thank you. Donato? Well, I believe in partnership, in partnership building. And I think that um, science diplomacy is the perfect tool to forge new partnerships and to reinforce the ones that already exist. So uh, let's work towards science diplomacy. I think the World Academy is a, a natural reservoir for it. Lots of knowledge, lots of channels that can be activated. And uh, we have, uh, we have uh, our own campaign ongoing uh, for human security, uh, human security, resilience, uh, and therefore sustainable development and uh, and ultimately peace. Uh, so this uh, campaign that I think should unfold and continue unfolding uh, towards uh, peace, towards this uh, peace offensive uh, that we can all uh, conduct together. Last but not least, uh, Phoebe, my co-chair, please. Okay, so I, I would like to say that um, I think we all agree that uh, science uh, combined with uh, transformative uh, technologies um, uh, create uh, new pathways for making progress on difficult national uh, local problems. And uh, it is instrumental that is used as a force for goods. I mean, in the 80s, the development of new refrigerants helped eliminate the opposition for the enactment of the Montreal Protocol. I just want to say that science offers solutions, but I, I agree that uh, what we also derive from this uh, talk is that we need to build trust between mm -hmm. science and all other stakeholders in order to give space for mutual understanding and then 
enable this mutual understanding to function as a platform for advancement. Uh, Gary is also with us, the president of, uh, uh, of the World Academy of Art and Science. So I would give the last minute to Gary. Can we do that, uh, Moni? No problem, of course. Uh, Monet uh, asked me to give a word of wisdom to close our discussion. Yes. I, think, uh, I think Erasmus in Rotterdam said it best, that science without conscience is a ruin of the soul. Agreed. Thank you very much. Gary, you have the screen for a minute or two, if you like. That's hard to follow Emil's quote. Uh, I just want to say briefly, First, to thank you all for a very, very stimulating, important discussion, doing exactly what we'd hoped that our panels would do in this uh, WAS at 64. We're not, we didn't come here to solve all the problems of the world. We came here to ask the most important questions that the Academy should be focusing on as it goes forward. And I mentioned in the chat, it just so happens that the issue so beautifully raised by Emil and responded by others about the apparent and, and real contradictions uh, that have to be reconciled between the development of pure knowledge uh, and the use of that knowledge as a double-edged sword. The very next session coming up in the B stream uh, is a, a session on the future of business education and how we recognize and train the, next, the future generation of our leaders to understand the entire range of issues that have been discussed in this meeting, uh, because uh, business is uh, a, a real source of power in the world, and we need that power. We need it to be used in the most constructive ways possible for the betterment of all, and that is a challenge for us, and I thank you for bringing it out uh, so eloquently in this discussion. Thank you all very much. Uh...